a double header, Tom. That's a steelhead. Ho! Welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer, and for the next 13 episodes, we're gonna show you just how easy it is to catch all different kinds of fish on a fly rod. We're gonna take you to some great places across North America. We're gonna have some fun along the way, and I hope you do too. Oh yeah, nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly. You're going to have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Bahamas Tourism, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Fly fishing has a special appeal to many people, whether they're young, old, man or woman. Fly fishing appeals to many because it's artistic, relaxing, fun, and exciting. Oh, man. Nice and it's a great way to connect with nature. But some people believe fly fishing is really technical and far too difficult to learn. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's really quite simple to master. Anyone can learn to fly fish. The best way to start is on a local pond filled with small bass or sunfish. I took my friends Sophia, Amelia, and Julia to a local pond to show them what fly fishing is all about. You'll see that they catch fish just like you can. We started out the way all kids should begin fishing, with live bait and a bobber. Since it was grasshopper season, we caught some live hoppers, which was half the fun for all of us. Got some grasshoppers here. So we're gonna put a grasshopper on the bobber. Okay, excuse us, grasshoppers, we need another volunteer. Excuse us, we need another volunteer. There we go, there's a volunteer. Press the button and go. There you go, perfect, okay. Let's see if anybody's willing to oh, take reel it. In, reel it in, reel it in, you got one, you got one. There he is, that's a largemouth bass, all right. Wow, look at that. Come on, mister. Now that's a baby largemouth bass, and the way to land these is you can just put your thumb right in here. They don't have any real teeth, they just have little teeth. See those little teeny uh, tiny teeth? They feel just like sandpaper, wanna feel it? Ah, uh, cool. Feels just like sandpaper. Good job! Then we replaced the live grasshopper with an artificial grasshopper fly. We still use the bobber and push button rod to show them that an artificial fly is just another way to catch fish. Grasshopper. It looks like a grasshopper. It's got, see, it's got legs, it's got wings, it's got that little red stuff, and it's got a fat head. Doesn't it look <laughs> yeah. like a hopper? Yeah. Just like with that real grasshopper, we can't throw this very far, so we can't just put it on that line, right? right. We gotta have some weight to get it out there. So what's the weight that's gonna get the- The bobber. The bobber, okay. So I'm gonna tie on this fake grasshopper. Twitch it. Okay, stop. There's one looking at it. Oh, he got it! You got him on a fake grasshopper. What do you what do you think, huh? Pretty cool. Yeah. You wanna see another way of fishing a fake sure. grasshopper? Alright. We're gonna put this down and we're gonna use a different kind of rod. Fly rod. Fly rod. Fly rod. How did you know? I don't really know how to use it. Finally, we replaced the push button rod with a fly rod, the most efficient way to get a small, almost weightless lure like a fly out there. So here's the deal. We don't need a bobber either uh, on this thing. Need... 
You know why? Um, why? You know why? Because this is the weight you cast. Oh. This is a long, skinny bobber. And what I can do is I can take this thing and go like that. And I can put that fly out there just with this. All I do is flick it and it goes out there. And the grasshoppers um, didn't want to volunteer, but we volunteered them. Yep. Up, 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 up. He's looking at it. Ah! Okay. So you've just seen the difference between fly fishing and all other kinds of fishing. The line provides the weight to get the fly to the target, not the lure itself. Oh, what, a, what a nice jump. You know why they call him a largemouth? Why? Right. Well, they have large mouth. <laughs> we also caught on a fake grasshopper. We caught on a fake grasshopper. Oh, a yeah. real a real bass on a fake grasshopper. What do you think? Yeah. Nice job, Amelia. And off he goes. Then the girls went fishing with their dad, Randy. It was great to see them use the fly rod interchangeably with the push button rod, not treating it like some kind of mystical way to fish. Fly fishing is easy. Anyone can do it. You just have to learn the basics. Wow. Next, we look at the origins of fly fishing and help explain why this outdoor activity has been steadily increasing in popularity. Fly fishing has been around for quite some time. It began in the Middle Ages when people noticed fish eating small bugs that were tough to keep on the hook as bait. Early fly fishers didn't do much casting and didn't use a reel. Their methods were very similar to a Japanese method of fishing called tenkara, which has become increasingly popular around the world. At the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, fly rods got better, and fly anglers learned to cast longer distances, then they added reels to store line. They also began catching bigger fish that would make long runs. This new equipment helped increase the interest in fly fishing. In the second half of the 20th century, Fly fishing became more popular with everyone from presidents to movie stars to ordinary anglers who were looking for more of a challenge when they were fishing. Fly fishing was suddenly the new and exciting way to catch fish. Best of all, the sport expanded from being just for trout to saltwater fish and warm water species like bass and pike. At the American Museum of Fly Fishing in Manchester, Vermont, the history of fly fishing is well chronicled. If you get a chance to visit the region, I highly recommend you spend some time in the museum. It really is fascinating. All this old equipment is really neat to see, but what do you really need today to get started in fly fishing? You know, I think one of the things that intimidates people about fly fishing is a vision of a fly angler with waders and vest and creel and, a, and all these gadgets <laughs> hanging from the vest. But you don't need all that stuff. What do you need? What are the bare essentials you need to get started in fly fishing? Well, you need that basic rod, reel, and line outfit in one form or another. You need a rod, you need a reel, you need a line, and you need a leader. What else do you need? What are the bare essentials that you need? You really only need a pair of snips to cut your line. You need a box of flies, and it doesn't have to be a fancy box. It can be the box that you get for free when you buy the flies in the store. And you probably are going to need a couple different spools of tippet material. That's all. You can wade wet, which means just in a pair of sandals and a pair of shorts. You can fish from shore. You can fish from a canoe or other kind of boat. You don't need to get dressed in waders right away if you don't need them. So when you get started in fly fishing, keep it simple at first. You'll find lots of uses for those gadgets later on, but you don't need them when you're starting out. You need a rod, a reel, and line, just like any other kind of fishing. But a fly rod bends in a specific way so that it can put the fly where you want it, but also to play a fish without breaking your leader. For much of fly fishing, the reel is simply a device to store line, and you retrieve and otherwise manipulate the line with your hands. Sometimes, when a big fish is hooked, the reel takes over to provide a mechanical drag and to retrieve line between runs. A fly line has weight because the line is what casts the fly. A fly line can float or sink, but for now we'll stick with a floating line, which is by far the most common type. 
Between the line and the fly is a leader made from regular monofilament fishing line that has been specially tapered to present the fly properly. You'll see scores of different fly fishing knots, but for most fishing, you need only two. One to tie the fly to the leader and another to tie two pieces of leader material together. To tie a fly to your leader for trout, bass, and panfish, the easiest knot to use is the clinch knot and it's one of the best. With the clinch knot, which you may already know if you've done any kind of fishing, you go through the eye of the hook, wind the tag or short end around the standing part of the leader, pass the tag end back through the loop right in front of the eye, and then tighten by pulling on the fly and the standing part of the leader. To tie on a new tippet to the end of your leader, or to tie two pieces of leader material together, you can use a triple overhand, also called the surgeon's knot. This is just a simple triple overhand knot where you pass both ends of the leader, including the tag end, through the loop three times. The line and leader are tapered to make your presentation better. Fly rods and fly lines are rated with a number system that ranges from 1 through 12, with 1 the lightest and thinnest, and 12 the heaviest and thickest. Lighter lines are more delicate, heavier lines are needed to throw bigger flies and to cast farther, especially when you have windy conditions. Luckily, fly rods made for light lines are more flexible to protect light leaders, and heavier fly rods have enough power to make long casts and enough reserve power to fight big fish. For most trout and panfish, a size 4 or 5 rod in line is about right. Rods lighter than a 4 weight are used for small fish or very delicate presentations and are really considered specialty rods. For a good all-round rod for both trout and smaller bass, size 6 is often used. For bigger bass, smaller pike, steelhead, salmon, and smaller saltwater species, a size 8 is the most popular size. For very large flies and very heavy fish, a size 10, 11, or even 12 might be used. Don't forget, a fly rod should always be matched to the correct line size, otherwise it won't perform at its best. As you can see, by comparing these popular lures to flies, they both do the same thing. Both try to imitate bait fish and other forage like frogs. The only real difference is that fly patterns are virtually weightless in comparison to lures. The weight of a lure is how an angler propels it to the target. With fly fishing, we propel a feather-light fly pattern to the target, except we use the weight of the line. The simple mechanics of physics help us cast virtually weightless flies using a long rod combined with a weighted line. And of course, the actual casting is part of the magical appeal of fly fishing. Next, we'll learn some basic casts that will help you get started no matter where you fish. Casting is one of the great aspects of fly fishing. Many find the rhythmic motion is relaxing and even therapeutic. Like other activities such as golf or tennis, you need to learn the essentials and practice in order to achieve success. But the key is that it's easy to learn. I can't think of a better person to introduce the basics of casting than my friend Pete Kutzer. Pete's an instructor and has taught thousands of people to cast a fly rod. He truly loves teaching and his enthusiasm is infectious. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. And if you really want to catch fish, the first cast you got to learn how to do in fly fishing is a reverse double mocha spiral cast. Just kidding. All fly rods basically need three things in order to, uh, to work. The first thing they need to do is they need to bend. When that rod bends, we call it loaded. It's loaded with energy, essentially. The next thing that rod needs to do is come to a very abrupt stop. That's going to transfer the energy from the rod into the line, getting that line to roll out. When we cast, we need to make this rod bend and stop twice. Bend and stop, bend and stop. Once behind us, and then once again in front of us. The third thing 
we need to get this fly rod to do is we need to get that rod tip that I'm pointing right at you to move in the straightest line possible. Straight to the back cast and straight to the forward cast. If I get that rod to move straight back and straight forward, the line is gonna travel straight back and straight forward. If I travel in an arch, come up then down, up then down, that's gonna send that line down into the ground or into the water and down into the bushes behind you. So just think bend and stop, bend and stop, and travel in that nice straight path. When we're traveling in that straight path to a stop on that back cast and that straight path to a stop on the forward cast, we have to make sure that we pause in between those two casts and let that line roll out behind us. Just as that leader is about to straighten out that thin, clear piece of line, then we can begin our forward cast. When we're casting though, we can move in a straight path virtually wherever you want. You can make a straight path up over your head. This is kind of a classic trout style of casting. You can make that straight path more out to the side. This is more common in some saltwater situations. Or let's say you're in a tricky situation where you have to cast underneath a bush or underneath a tree, we can make a low angle cast. Down here, and get that fly out underneath something. So that straight line can be at any angle we want around our body. When we make that straight path back in that straight path forward, we have to stay in that same straight plane. What we don't wanna do is get a curl around our body behind us or around our body out in front of us. We wanna stay almost as if there was a wall out there to the side in that nice straight line back and forward. When we're making that cast, we wanna start off with a good grip. You want that thumb on top and a nice relaxed grip and that rod relatively in line with your forearm. We're going to start nice and low and we don't want to go too far back when we make that back cast. We're going to bring that rod up using a little bit of forearm, then a little bit of wrist. And we want to stop somewhere, you know, across from our shoulder or across from our ear, not way back like this. If we come back too far, that usually sends that line down and back and it's going to end up getting stuck in the trees or in the bushes. So rod tip low. Thumb on top, smooth acceleration to that stop, smooth acceleration to that stop. Think pop to a stop, if you will. And then when you stop on that forward cast, think stop, then drop. Stop the rod first, that's gonna allow that line to roll out and straighten out in the air. Once that line straightens out, gravity takes over, then we can lower that line back down to the water and get that line back underneath your index finger because now you're fishing. Sometimes when we're casting, we have very limited back cast space. We can't make that complete back cast and send that line behind us. We might have an obstacle behind us like a tree, a rock, um, some bushes, maybe another angler. And in that situation, we want to do a cast called the roll cast. Now the roll cast is a great cast, but we kind of want to use it on the water. We need to set up an anchor point and what we call a D-loop. This is very common, you'll hear this a lot in spay casting. The D-loop is this little bit of line here behind me, right here, and the anchor point is that line touching the water. We need some line touching the water, and we want our hand up kind of near our ear or across from our shoulder. From this point, then we can just make a nice forward flick of the wrist, or a nice forward cast, and that's gonna send that line out. So we just lift this line up and come back nice and slowly, dragging that line across the water, stop right across our ear. I like to tell people it's almost like you're talking on a telephone, but it's somebody really obnoxious, so you're holding the phone away from your ear. You're going fishing again? And then from this point, just a nice flick to a stop, or pop to a stop, if you will, around eye level, and that's gonna get that line to roll right out. When we shoot this line, we wanna have good timing. We wanna make sure that we're releasing that line at just the right moment. And there's a couple different ways you can do this. You can see it or you can feel it. To see it, what you're looking for is that nice loop rolling out in front of you. As soon as you see that loop, that's your visual indicator on when to shoot the line. See the loop, then you can release that line and start to shoot it. If you wanna feel it, you can feel that rod come to that good abrupt stop. Come to that nice stop, then release that line. So you can see it or you can feel it. If your timing is off, if you release that line too soon, what can happen is that line can wrap around your arm, wrap around your rod, and it won't shoot out very nicely. So we want that good timing and release that line after we stop. Make sure when you're releasing that line that you feather it through your hand. You don't wanna just let that line go and then strip it back in before that line gets straight. 
So just think, open that bale, hold that line in your other hand, your non-casting hand, make that nice stop, feather it through your hand, back underneath that finger, closing the bale, then we can strip that line back in. Remember, keep that rod tip nice and low. Every other cast you hear about in fly fishing is a variation of either the pick up and lay down cast or the roll cast as we've seen here. And you'll use these casts more often than any others. Practice these as often as you can and you'll have a lot more fun fishing with a fly. People love fly fishing for many reasons. For some, it's a connection they feel with nature. Whether it's wading on a mountain stream, casting from a boat on their local pond, or fishing in a mountain river, fly fishing helps them get into the outdoors. For others, fly fishing is a means of relaxing, unwinding, and clearing their minds. But there's one common thread among all of them, and that's that fly fishing is a fascinating way to fish. Fly fishers have to completely clear their minds in order to focus on the task at hand, which is fooling a fish. You have to forget everything about home, worries about money, life, or full-time job. This in turn helps you relax and even solve difficult problems because you've cleared your mind. Don't be intimidated by fly fishing, it's just another way of fishing. Some people make it complex because they enjoy it that way, but you want to keep it simple at first. You could even catch trout with a simple outfit like this. You've just seen how easy fly fishing can be, and the principle is really the same. Whether you're fishing for trout, bass, bluegills, pike, bonefish, or even marlin or sailfish, you've got a rod, a reel, a line, and a fly. It's just another form of fishing. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that it's the easiest thing you've ever done, but I bet it's a lot easier than you think. So keep it simple at first. Concentrate on basic techniques and worry about all that extra gear later. Just get out there and catch some fish in a local pond and see how much fun fly fishing can be. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing. Algoma Country. Destination Ontario. Main Office of Tourism. Yellowstone Teton Territory. Crazy Rainbow Ranch. Bahamas Tourism. Adipose Boat Works. Global Rescue. Trout Unlimited.